Hey everybody, it's Triple L coming to talk about uh, My Hero Academia chapter 365. Oh right, this is My Simp Academia where we like sing the praises of Hero Academia and also responsibly criticize when possible. Anyway, hey, welcome. I'm really excited. I'm really happy about this. And the, the reason I'm excited is because Horikoshi, like, Horikoshi had a dang bubble. All right, yeah. So let's just cover like the simplest thing, all right? Clearly, I was right. I was right to be worried about giving Bakugo multiple infections. I was right because Horikoshi was thinking about it too. So clearly, like I was go like I was going in the right direction of think at the end of the day, what I really realized is that Horikoshi is at least as half as paranoid as I am, uh, which just makes me incredibly happy. But I, I really hope it's not affecting him too much though cuz like paranoia can be crippling and like you know, there's there's I really hope the guy is taking care of himself, which might be in question given like the breaks and also how short the chapter is. Any hoosers, chapter 365. Uh what to talk about first? There's just so much to talk about, honestly. Uh, commenters pointed out cool things. And I'm just trying to decide what to go for here first. I had this whole p speech planned out yesterday, but now I've kind of forgotten. Um, I guess like, let's address just the general stuff going on with Edshot, because this was kind of the most important stuff from last week. Me personally, when I see that bubble, like it does a lot of different things for me. Uh, Commenter Sarge was pointing out to me that uh, the bubble seems like a plot convenience or a convenience in general and like yeah it's convenient um, but there's ways of looking at it and I, for this one I wouldn't be too harsh on Horikoshi because like it's all, there's only 13 pages and the thing is now that he's gone this far to say that yo I had this bubble I'm going to use it to disinfect things because I just happen to have the bubble now he's gone this far he's answered such a very small thing I don't think there's any point in asking about like Bakugo's brain, whether or not like he's suffered brain death or anything like that, or his brain deteriorated. Like he's, Edshot's probably acting within the time. There's no point in asking about like internal bleeding or bleeding in general or blood loss. Like any simple biological problem that you can come up with, there's no point in asking about it because the the author will most likely hand wave it or he'll most likely add a line to justify it um, in upcoming chapters again the fact that he couldn't do it in this chapter is just i think the a, a natural effect of only having 13 pages here to work with so yeah now that the, and i've talked about this on the live stream but now that the author went this far to <laughs> clean up ed shot it's like yeah okay you're you're he's putting thought into it um and when you look at what ed shot ultimately did everywhere else it's actually the better implementation that I was hoping for n from last week. Uh, so with this one, as we go forward, you know, you might be asking about that bubble, but I would just say give it some time just because a lot of things are going on. And in regards to the bubbles, uh, there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. That strange little bubble that pops out of nowhere. So, you know, some commenters just, they made a lot more fun of it. I remember White Despair was talking like he just pulls this bubble out of nowhere. But... This is Hero Academia, a world where Bakugo's backpack turns into, like, a self-replicating machine gun cannon pack, alright? Like, legitimately, I could not care less about where the bubble came from. Just because of Hero Academia, people have pockets. If Bakugo could shove a giant machine gun array in his backpack, or, like, wherever you want, whatever you want to call it, if he could shove that in there, is there any point in asking where a bubble came from? Um, so that's the first thing in terms of the storage. It's like, it doesn't matter. Like, there could be 101 explanations for where the bubble came from. Uh, the other thing with the bubble, um, when I'm looking at it, if we we're trying to break it down, I would ask, like, okay, what's the point of having the bubble there, you know? What does this add to the story? Did you need to make it a bubble? Because, like, really, if it's about sanitation, Edshot, given that he's most likely to be infiltrating people's bodies, given that he's, he and Best Genius are the most likely ones to be sewing people up, on the spot both of them it would make sense for them to have uh, disinfecting solutions on their persons that they can just quickly use it's here academia it's a world where people are able to manufacture things from people's compounds I assume they have some like long acting uh, sanitization compounds it's a near futuristic world with strange limits on its technology so you know Edshot could have just put out some special hero support device specifically for disinfecting himself uh, but they're using Wash's bubble instead, and usually people's 
quirks and the products that come from it are more unique than the support items themselves. The support items are usually modeled after people's quirks. So I, I accept that Wash's bubble probably has more to it than what science can replicate at this level. But when I see the bubble, you know, I'm thinking, did they have it just for sterilizing? Um, Jason Thomas, another commenter, had an idea, like maybe everyone has a bubble and the bubble is there specifically in case everyone has to get inside them and get away. We know those bubbles are strong enough to hold hospital equipment. So yeah, it could probably hold the weight of a body. Um, so when we're going into the future, what we're gonna be looking at here is like, did the bubble have another purpose or, were the, or was the bubble specifically there for people that were likely to infiltrate other people's bodies? And in that case, um, does that mean best genus have a bubble? Uh, what I see here with the bubble is that now that it's been brought out, it really elevates the standard for a lot of these heroes. I would accept less if the heroes say that they were unprepared on one particular issue or they forgot a particular item. If the heroes are, ca if the heroes are caught equipment if the heroes are caught uh, unprepared equipment wise like it it will now fall under more scrutiny and i think that's an interesting little thing another thing with the bubble too um from a meta element is that the bubble might have been there to make it look like wash was doing something valuable this might be holy Koshi saying like oh yeah you know wash yeah go bro like uh, he's also involved in this too he's also helping out in very unique ways that only he can help out in that's another thing that y you know you could end up doing because it makes again wash feel more valuable now ultimately when it comes down to this bubble that i know so many people are talking about i think there i think the worst implementation here has edge shot being the only one with the bubble given that edge shot can run a wire through that bubble and it doesn't pop it probably is a super durable bubble but yeah at the very least best genus needs to have his own bubble if we're going by some kind of logic here now, Horikoshi spent one panel uh, working on this, and it makes things really interesting because w right now here at Academia, we might be in a kind of special place to see a kind of thinking that we've never really seen before. It seems like what the author is doing now is saying, hey, things are not going to be that depressing. Hey, people actually did something worthwhile. And if you look at this chapter, you actually do have the author going in there and doubling down on the idea that, hey, you actually, the damage did something to Shigaraki. It wasn't all for naught. Um, and this is what brings up the more interesting stuff. The author only had 13 pages. The guy's not doing well. It's very clear that he's, he must be compromised. Um, and White Despair, a commenter, brought up a really good point. A good chunk of the chapter is also reused panels or panels like or that are just black backgrounds. And when I say a good chunk, Let's look at it. So like the entirety of page 12 or let's say 75% of page 12 is a flashback. We have other flashbacks in page 9. We have more flashbacks um, on page 4. There's a, a few white panels. In a chapter where you had so little pages, you still had him uh, repeating stuff. Every, every panel that was a flashback was pretty much the author saving work. Um, and so what you see here is that we have a guy... He might be uh, compromised health-wise. The chapters have been getting shorter. We definitely know that he's overworked. He's not able to produce an entirely new chapter. He has to rely on flashbacks. So what we're ultimately seeing here is the bare minimum that he thinks is important. And in terms of that bare minimum, what we see ultimately come out here is that he has Shigaraki reaffirming that, hey, things happen and people are managing to do damage to Shigaraki. Overall, I think probably going to see more headway be made on Shigaraki. It's very interesting what we ultimately got in the chapter and I'm looking forward to see if Horikoshi is going to make things less depressing. Anyway, uh, let's go into the page by page walkthrough. We talked about a lot of things so far but there's a lot more details that we need to cover. So page one, we go into it and it's the explanation of edge shot stuff and it's done through an omnipresent narrator. So the most important thing here is because some people made mention some points here is that it's not being done by Edshot. This is like the narrator himself saying it. I doubt that it's Izuku. It's just a narrator. Um, so it's just explaining what exactly is going to happen here. And of course, Horikoshi, that paranoid guy who, you know, I, Horikoshi, I really hope Central Hospital is empowering you. Um, he goes in and he talks about the whole sterilization. I think that's really good. Um, again, he went so far given that he didn't have many pages to work with this week i'm 100 percent okay waiting um to see more explanations about the things that are going on here if we get to the end of here if we get into the end of here academia and he doesn't explain where that bubble came from then maybe i might criticize it but right now given the benefit of the doubt 
the man's probably ill. Uh, we go into page two, um, where Edshot's infiltrating the boy's innards. Now, for page two, I gotta say, I wasn't ready to actually see the detail, um, but here we go. Uh, the damage to Bakugo's heart is as simple as stitching it up. Now, here's what I want to talk about. Because this is exactly what I was talking about when we sh we saw the image of Bakugo's heart being destroyed. Bakugo's heart was not in tatters. It was it was ripped up, but ultimately it's this kind of thing that you can just cover up. Um, and this is what I was referring to when I was talking about be careful with the damage depiction. The heart, it was not... No one at no point did it look like he, Shigaraki went straight through that heart. Um, that the way the heart was damaged was ultimately covered up by uh, panel effects, or like you know just the white. That's why I didn't take it any seriously. Now we do see that there is a lot more damage, but ultimately all the damage can be stitched up according to um, according to Edshot. So when it comes to the implementation, the implementation very good. This is what it should have been. It should not have been Edshaw becoming a heart because that was nonsensical. Him stitching up the multiple wounds is a much better implementation. It makes way more sense. I um, mean, this is what we were advocating for last week. Again, I feel really vindicated here just because, the, you know, the if you study the past of Shonen Jump and Shonen Jump series, a lot of the things that we're seeing here is very consistent with Shonen Jump. Obscuring the actual damage so people don't know how much damage happened, then doing some little wordplay or not doing wordplay, then adding some little more details to make it look like it was a little bit worse, but not actually really for the power set, making it consi making it something that the power set could fix. I'm not going too far with the power set and the power logic within the world. This is, I feel, this is classic Shonen Jump isms. Um, so very happy to see it here. I'm not surprised at all. This is 100% within the standard that the magazine establishes for its main Shonen Jump series. Now, um, talking about the page quality, I'm really happy that you can actually see where the stitches are. Because on the scans and the fan scans, you couldn't really see this level of detail. So props to Horikoshi for going in there and putting the extra level of detail and making it very clear. Yeah, back goes heart. It is so intact that all you have to do is stitch some fibers together. Um, again... This might, this might be one of those pages where like, you don't trust the image, just because, but in this case, the image itself was not showing you what exactly was destroyed. Um, so, uh, there's other things that happen here on page two. Uh, first, the author goes out of his way to make sure that we know that Genus was doing something to help back go. So, this is something saying, like, okay, Genus was already working on it, so he was already minimizing how much blood loss was occurring. Ed, we then have Edshot stating, well, he could not do everything, therefore, Edshot will now be valuable. Edshot will be doing something only he can do. Um, he brings in that the lungs are also injured, which logically makes sense. The lungs would be injured in this kind of attack, I guess, where something got a little bit burst. We then have Edshot saying that, yeah, my body can fix every organ inside and out. Uh, while aiding the pulmonary function so that's just saying like yeah while i'm fixing this i can also get uh the heart beating again so he's pretty much doing a lot all at once so the thing with the bottom panel is that this entire bottom third is all about justifying and making sure the reader knows who did what and what was valuable and who can only do one particular um action so best genus slowed things down, Edshot ultimately fixes things. You have to understand this is valuable because like Horikoshi right now is in a position where he has to do more with text um, and he has to make sure he shows that everyone was worthwhile here because this is what the final arc's about. He wants to show that people are worthwhile. It's this kind of thinking that makes you think, yeah, you know, Gentle Labrava probably going to show up. It's this kind of thinking that, okay, yeah, I can see how Class 2 Way will do something because they'll probably come in to help Aizawa or something mm -hmm. like that. Okay, we move into page 3, and this is a dubious page. Um, on page 3, we see that Bakko is spitting up blood. Um, we see that Genus is begging for people to keep fighting. Um, or, sorry, not Genus. We see that Edshot is begging for people to keep fighting. And then we have the first indication that Horikoshi wants to establish that the efforts are not in vain. And again, if Horikoshi is responding to the bleakness of everyone attacking Shigaraki and nothing really happening then this line makes more sense because he's going really hard to say like yeah we are doing stuff and we're making ground anyway we end off this page with the narration that remaining in the extremely in this extreme state slowly but surely eats away at Edshot's life now I talked about this line a lot during the live stream because this line is really important because if we're talking about shonenisms shonen jump likes shaving people's uh, lifespans down um, to say that they did something worthwhile um, now, there were criticisms about this line. 
and I remember Sarge mentioning it of just pretty much the general criticism is, yo, how does Edshot know that his life is like burning away? Well, the thing is here, you have to look at the fact that it's the narration that's saying it. Edshot might not actually know that his life is being burnt out. But according to the narration, we know that this is something he can do because of training. He doesn't necessarily know his life is going away, but like this this is very easy to logic out. There's no problem with saying that his life is burning away. It's just pretty much Edshot got wrecked by Shigaraki with All Might level strength. The man's probably bleeding out. The man's probably super injured. Doing something that's relatively stressful and requires a lot of focus. Most likely, yeah, you could you could imagine a lot of his wounds are being aggravated and he's slowly bleeding out or he's slowly bleeding in a weird way. Um, that's Or he's putting more stress on his body that's already mangled. So he might have a heart attack while he's inside of... She, she, um, while he's inside of Bakugo. Uh, so when I look at this line, in ter like in the first, just to like go for the first level of criticisms, it's like it doesn't matter whether or not Edgeshot knows that he's burning his life away. The fact of the matter is this is just something that's naturally happening. Um, the narrator being omnipresent is already, it, do like it, it takes away that, it takes away that principal argument because it doesn't matter whether or not Edgeshot knows. Um, Edgeshot can do it because he's practiced. He's going pretty much plus ultra right now um, to try and do this. Now, with the spoilers, it was kind of hard to tell, but this line's going to be dubious. Um, when you usually, in Shonen Jump, and in right, well, no, this is a Shonen Jumpism. In Shonen Jump, when you say someone lost years off of their lifespan, they do that because they want you to think that, yo, this technique had a cost. But usually that person will survive. You can go to One Piece and you can see all the examples of One Piece doing it. With Edgeshot, what's, what's tough here is that this final line, remaining in this extreme state slowly but surely eats away at Edgeshot's life. It's hard, to, it's hard to tell whether they're talking about Edgeshot's life right now or, or, his overall, or his overall lifespan. And I looked at the fan scans and the fan scans are also very unclear. What I will say for the readers is right now... It looks like what is being conveyed is that Edshot's going to be dead or close to death by the end of this. But this is a slight mistranslation. And what Horikoshi is actually referring to is Edshot's overall lifespan. We might be in a situation where Edshot does this incredible thing, but then he survives the battle. And what it ultimately does is that you know, the author will go harder on, oh yeah, he lost 10 years off of his life. And it's like, okay, so instead of living to 90, he's going to live to 80. Awesome, right? So this is one of the first ones, just be just be ready for it, because I can see that people are going to like get really annoyed or really upset that Edshot survives the battle. But yo, it's here Academia where people are super hardy. Actually, it's, if Edshot survives the battle in general, that's going to be another indication that Horikoshi swapped over to doing... Um, to making things less dire for the fandom. Anyway, on page four, we go into like the very strange thing of Shigaraki noticing that he wrecked Bakugo. Um, and now, something that happens here that we know from the spoilers is that Shigaraki goes from using the all for one pronoun for referring to himself and uses the Shigaraki one. And on this page, we also see the flashback from one of the early chapters of Shigaraki wanting to destroy everything. So, this was just really interesting because this shows that it's more Shigaraki in control now. Just because of the way everything's going and him remembering his own little flashback there. And then he gets fixated on Bakugo, which I found really interesting in general how he fixates on it. But I guess that's Shigaraki. The, fix the fixation, though, says that he's not thinking clearly. Um, page 4 is just the flashbacks uh, justifying why he's going in. Um, it seems to me like he's acting also on like primal urges uh, or like very deep-rooted ur urges. Shigaraki goes in, uh, Genus counters, and we have Mirko um, defending. Now, Mirko honestly should be dead. Shigaraki should have squeezed the life out of Mirko and then jumped to go wreck other things. Um, so the problem here is that what's being established is that All for One is way too much of... A lazy person like he just likes watching people writhe within his grip he likes touching people and just seeing them like kind of like curse him and all that kind of stuff he likes seeing people I guess just fight just put up a feudal resistance I guess but Shigaraki because he has ADD he forgets all about Merkel releases her Merkel is able to get out of it uh, apparently with a single kick and is able to kick Shigaraki enough to make him wince 
on page six, you can see that she could act. He's trying to hold her back, but Mirko doesn't care. Mirko's like a freaking rabid dog. Like, actually, did you see page seven? She looks like a rabid dog. Anyway, we go to page seven, and we see that, hey, he's staggering now. Um, and the chapter seems to be indicating that it's because of the explosion that something's going on. Um, so what I see here is that he's making it clear that he's accumulating damage. And, like, Shigaraki even says that he hasn't felt real damage, but it's like, you have a burned face. That's damage. Um, so now we're finally starting to see, like, hey, like, so now we're finally starting to see the author be way more, um, he's being more overt with what's being hurt here. We go into the bomb page 7 and we have Merkel pointing out like, hey, you're pretty gentle. And it's like, yeah, you know what? That's a really good criticism. I gotta say again, just because like, holy crap, man. Yo, this is, this girl's hardcore, man. Like, I hope she, look, pers you know, I, I think I might have mentioned this last time, but like, personally, I think it would be really cool if All for One went in there and ripped all the limbs off of Merkel just so that she kind of matches. She's symmetrical. I think that would be a really evil thing for him to do. I think it would make All for One look like he's actually like a threat here instead of just letting the girl go. Because now look, she's lost an arm but she's still going. She has one leg and one leg's all she needs to make Shiganagi stagger. Um, we go into page 8 and we see something really cool. And this is really good in a world where Shigaraki has not evolved into having super hearing or x-ray vision, has not evolved into having a super sense of touch. Meteor going in there and covering up Shigaraki's eyes. This is what should have been happening the whole time because this is like one of the few things he can do. I, I was saying it from the beginning. Meteor should be going in there and poking Shigaraki in the eyeballs because it's going to obscure everything. I'm glad he's finally doing it. Uh, because of that, we have Mirko get um, around Shigaraki pretty well. We have her across page 8 and 9 also reminding us of her general character and her heroic identity that being someone who's gonna go all the way like look at the end of this thing man like Merkel like a hundred percent comes out being one of the best female characters of Hero Academia it's because like you sometimes you don't need drama you, you know you don't need um, someone struggling you just need to see someone who even though she should be struggling is going at it a hundred and fifty percent like at the end of this no one's gonna doubt Merkel's convictions in this thing like, like, actually, Mirko's is one of those situations where the actions are really speaking louder than any lack of character development or character exposition. Anyway, um, on page 9, we see Shigaraki trying to make sense of things. Um, it's hard to say what's going on here in terms of Shigaraki's cognition. Like, he figures out that he might have felt threatened, but, like, I feel like we all, we all knew that there. Like, Shigaraki was threatened. Um, the readers definitely knew it. Shigaraki's catching on to it. But it it looks like the mechanism as to why he's being damaged still hasn't been revealed here. And it doesn't look like Shigaraki knows why he's being damaged. He just knows that he's feeling threatened. Oh, my apologies, guys. He knows he's being threatened. It's, it's really interesting. Um, but again, this is one of those spots which makes you think like, okay, the author is saying, hey, guys, look, Bakugo was making a difference here. So like when Bakugo comes back, it's going to be really good. It's, that's pretty much what I think the author is promising to us. Uh, we go into page 10. Where it's Mirko finishing up her rhetoric uh, intermingled with Shigaraki's. Um, so overall her saying she isn't about to check out from the game with a life of regrets on the table. I think that's ultimately... Okay, actually, there's, there's a lot of idioms in that dialogue. Anyway, it's a really cool segment. Um, it makes sense. Like Again, Mirko's putting on a really... She's putting on a really great display. Uh, when it comes to Mirko, it's ultimately one of those things like... Yeah, she's gonna like she's gonna leave such a mark on here academia just because she took so much damage and never once did she complain. It just gives so much sense of character to her. Whereas so many other girls in here academia might be characterized by their weaknesses, like Momo's self doubt, um, Ochako's love problems, Toga's love problems and her like temperament as a child. Merkel over here is getting damaged. She's just really a regular girl who's just going all out. And never once did she complain, right? Like, while other characters in Hero Academia will be marked by their weakness and their overcoming of their weakness, Merkel will just be marked by just generally never, ever feeling weak and always going at things at more than 100%. And, you know, like, you might say, oh, you know, the, the girls that overcome their weaknesses, they're technically better characters. Yeah, yeah, that might be true on paper, but in terms of visceral responses, Merkel will always be more impressive than they were. Because Merkel will have accomplished things on a different scale and a different magnitude. 
But see, the, the thing with that, with the other girls, is that it's a very cerebral process of, like, telling yourself why this on paper should be better. Whereas with, uh, whereas with Merkel, Merkel didn't need words, right? Like, you just need to see what she was doing. It's, it, hits, it hits deeper, faster, pretty much. Um, we go into the bottom. Uh, we go into page 13, um, which is relatively interesting. We see panels of heroes across panels of Shigaraki's family with Tenko in between them. And the whole page is really interesting, but before I talk about serious things, I want to just make some jokes. Look at Nejure. The woman is still on the ground, and she has some of her little wisps going around her arm. And, I, you know, like, those wisps are made of her stamina. While Mirko is over there losing limbs, like, ripping off her limbs, ready to go against Destruction Incarnate. Nejure is on the floor, still trying to catch her breath. This girl, who's supposed to have way more stamina to be able to, like, counter the effects of her quirk, while everyone else is going at 110%, when, while Merkel got told, like, even if you're only, like, even if you're ripped apart, bite. Where this girl, <laughs> like, Nejure is still on the floor. Yeah, see, like, you know, again, you can make up all the excuses for Nejure, but, like, it doesn't look that good. Um, especially, like, again, this is, the, this is the issue with having Merkel right there, is that you can see Merkel is going far beyond where she should. Like, you don't think Merkel's tired? You don't think Merkel's, like, feeling all that pain? Nah, man, she's still going in. Um, she's going into plus ultra. Uh, because of the plus ultra mindset here, too, we, like, it makes, you know, it, it doesn't look as good with Nejire. Um, but, you know, don't take it too seriously. It's just a little bit of jokes, and if you want to, if you want to, like, look at it on a deeper level, the bigger issue here is that Nejire is the odd one out, um, and you have Merkel as the direct comparison to her right now, and it's like, you know, again, it's an issue of optics. Uh, you can spin this to make it really bad for Nejire. Okay, so on page 12, we see that Tenko is beginning his descent into Shigaraki again. So, like, why this bear pointed out that, well, Shigaraki's always been turning into Tenko, and that's a really fair point. But when I look at this, you know, it's just odd because there's already a Shigaraki on the outside and now you're having Tenko, like, turn into Shigaraki again. Which is okay because, like, Tenko did turn into Shigaraki once before. It should be possible for him to revert into Shigaraki. Um, now, it's interesting that he sees this, that he's a kid that wants to be destroyed. And he's thinking about the already destroy line. Like, he, I already destroyed them. Like, he's owning that, that he's destroying things. Um... And now he's just seeing things again. Like, it makes a lot of sense. It depends just how you want to, like, look at it. It looks like he's still a fragile mindset. And the things that made Shigaraki are still there. Uh, we go into page 13 and we see that he's producing the bodies. So this shouldn't come out of left field because we've seen that he's been producing, bod like, parts of bodies before. What is worth pointing out, though, is that he's scratching himself from within the vestige. Um, and the bodies are coming out. It does look like, yeah, you know, the bodies are a defense res or a defense mechanism or they're a stress response. The last time we saw his father's face come out was when he was getting freaked out um, about back ago. So it looks like whenever he gets freaked out, the, the parents are the ones to well up here. So this is just a really interesting situation with the Tenko part of the trio. Like, what exactly is he doing? And what's going to happen if we have Tenko ultimately become Shigaraki again? Like, what will it take for him to separate from Shigaraki again? I do think, like, the mental dynamics get a little bit messy here. Because, like, even Tenko's place inside of the trio, like, you're not 100% sure of it. Like, where exactly he's located. But, yeah, um, one thing, that, though, when I see the bodies coming out, I get really happy. Because it just means that it's much more likely that we're going to see Tenko get his own body eventually. Uh, but we're going to have to deal with that mental instability. We don't want to produce another Shigaraki uh, because someone looks at Tenko the wrong way. Um, a commenter, Seth, also had a comment about the heroes um, and how they're juxtaposed against the civilians. Um, and people are wondering, well, they were one. well, Seth and I guess, I think someone else was wondering whether or not we'll see those... We'll see any of those heroes match up against any of the clones. But yeah, we'll have to see. Uh, when it comes to the clones that are being produced, I don't think they're going to have the personality of the people that died. Just because I think that would be a little bit unreasonable. Because like, Tenko shouldn't have any of, their vestiges, any of their vestiges inside of them. So they should just be replicas made as a part of a stress response. Um, I mean, like if the author wants to say there's vestiges in there, then I feel like... 
we'd be going into an end game where the author would say like actually everyone has vestiges inside of them because everyone carries a version of their friends inside of them or something like that if you if they go in that direction that would be kind of that would be going really really far but so let's hope let, let's just hope that there is not a situation where everyone's vestiges are inside of Tenko or something like that or like all these families vestiges are in there like I know there's interpretations in new age school of thoughts that say that every person you meet you carry a version of of them inside of you I know like there's interpretations of that kind of like I know there's interpretations of that kind of like mass unconsciousness and um those kind of thought dynamics but like let's let's keep that one away from here that would just make things a little bit too uncontrollable just because it, everyone would have vestiges inside of them it's, it's too much anyway uh that's chapter 365 of my hero academia i have to run so i can't talk anymore but hey thank you guys so much for watching and until next time i hope you have an absolutely great day